Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, in Tim's words, an especially warm welcome to you tonight. Good to be with you all. If you are new or newer among us here at Calvary, a special greeting to you, whether it's online or here in person. We'd love to connect with you. You can find in that pew pocket in front of you a gray card that says welcome on one side, the other side um, has a place where you can give us some more information about yourself. At minimum, we'd like to be praying for you. We also would like to connect with you either after the service or in this coming week. So if you give us a way to connect with you, phone number, email, those kind of things, we'll reach out. A number of things for the life of the church. 
Um, our Calvary Kids Ministry and our youth group both start tomorrow um, following the 9.30 service, so at about 10.45 in the morning. If you've got children or youth in those ages, please encourage them to be present. At 10.45, if you're here at this service, that'd be appropriate time to come tomorrow. And then, as you may have received in our weekly update, um, Tim and the staff were pleased um, with the results of an interview team who interviewed, and we've now hired a new youth team lead, youth pastor, Jake Swain. Some of you know Jake. Jake has been part of Calvary um, for about six years. He served as an uh, intern as part of the call, and then he also has been a volunteer with our youth ministry. Jake does, among other things, uh, video production, and so that's a big part of what he's been doing over the last couple of years. We know him and his family well. He is uh, Ali, I just lost the last name. Coffee. Coffee, thank you. <laughs> Ali Coffee's brother, Daniel and Ali, he used to serve here. So I hope you get a chance to say hello and welcome back to Calvary. We're really pleased. And then uh, we, at this time of year, also want to make sure that you all know about our outreach and our ministry with the two college students. So on Tuesdays, we offer a no-cost lunch just to be good neighbors and give a word of encouragement and a good meal to college students on the Mines campus. That's Tuesdays at between 11.15 and 1 o'clock. And we also have a, a gathered college ministry at 4 o'clock on Tuesdays. Any more about those, please feel free to see me. Uh, we missed um, on the best Sunday to do it, so we're doing it on the second best Sunday to do it. Missed blessing all students and teachers and faculty as they return to school. So if you're currently a student in any age of school, um, an administrator, a teacher, a faculty member, will you stand up for us? Thanks. Fritz, you're part of that. Yeah. And then students, come on. We're trying to hide. We're not going to take hiding from you for too long. Will you join me as we pray for these, our brothers and sisters? Father, we thank you so much for the privilege it is to, to go and to learn, to know more and more about how you've made the world to work, how the natural world works, how we might work, how things fit together. Lord, we ask your blessing on all those who are educators and staff at schools and colleges. Lord, we pray for parents who are homeschooling and for all those who deal with tech in that, in that kind of arrangement. Lord, we especially lift up to you those who are learning, those gathered here this night, and those gathered across the community. We ask your blessing on them in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you all. Do we have any who are with us today who have uh, birthdays to celebrate, either today or later this week? If so, will you stand, tell us your name and about your birthday? I've got a list of others from Calvary. Any with us? Uh, Melinda Middleton tomorrow has a birthday, and Wednesday, Kathy Hitch and Marilyn Tomlin celebrate. On Thursday, Brian uh, Farchoni, Amelia Hoover, Beatrice Hoover, and Susanna Spandau all celebrate birthdays, Susan Spandau. On Friday, Darcy Callahan and Angela Cantola celebrate birthdays. And on Saturday, Charlie Andres and my son, Kate Campbell. Let's pray for them together. That prayer is on the right side of the bulletin. <laughs> Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they can. Comfort them and discourage the sorrowful. Raise them up as they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace which passes understanding abide in all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. How about a couple celebrating wedding anniversaries? Again, if you'll stand and tell us your name and about your anniversary. Excellent. Uh, here and Jennifer Robinson. For our anniversary is on Wednesday. How many years are you celebrating? Twelve. Congratulations. Did I hear that correctly? Twenty. Twenty. That's, I thought that can't be right. I got yeah. Twenty years. Congratulations. Let's just stand the hand of God's blessing over them and pray together. O oh, gracious and ever-living God, you have created us male and female in your image. Look mercifully upon this man and this woman who come to you seeking your blessing and assist them with your grace, that with true fidelity and steadfast love they may honor and keep the promises and vows they have made through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Happy anniversary and congratulations. Lord, open our lips. 
Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. This people in Jerusalem will be told, a scorching wind from the barren heights in the desert blows toward my people, but not to winnow or cleanse. A wind too strong for that comes from me. Now I pronounce my judgments against them. My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. When I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Therefore, the earth will mourn and the heavens above grow dark, because I have spoken and will not relent. I have decided and will not turn back. The word of the Lord. Amen. Please join together in reading today's song. Sing. Sing. Excuse me. Sing today's song. Thank you. given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 
Fear is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country? and go after the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. 
Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You can be seated. I went to a seminary that was known for it being um, an Anglo-Catholic kind of seminary, kind of, kind of high church, and if you don't know what that means, it's both a theological orientation, believing in God's presence, particularly in, in some particular ways in the sacraments, for instance, and because of that sense of God doing amazing things, a sense of reverence, a sense of God's holiness often reflected in the practices that we share together in worship. Those are, though these are things that I then appreciated and still appreciate and comfortably participate in, back then I earned the reputation in that particular context as being the token evangelical. That's 20-some years ago. <laughs> and so uh, when I first preached at seminary, the lessons were much like the lessons uh, from the Old Testament today, the psalm and the reading from Jeremiah of judgment. And as I started that sermon, I noted the irony that the token evangelical was going to have to preach about judgment. Well, when Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, and if we had read a little bit further, the lost brothers, he does so because the Jewish Pharisees and scribes, they complained that he was attracting the wrong kind of person. The Pharisees were, and the scribes were people that, there were two Jewish groups that saw themselves as being representative of what things should be like. The Pharisees were pious, attending especially to the Torah's purity codes, how to worship correctly and keep oneself unstained from the world. And they were known because of that, for their personal holiness. And they also had a reputation that they expected everybody else to be just as holy as they were, sometimes unkindly. The scribes were the experts in the scriptures. They studied the Old Testament with precision. They knew it inside and out. They could cite chapter and verse. And they were adept at interpretations, this against that. And they were able to point out the gnat of somebody else's sin and their failure if they did not obey all of the Torah. They, both groups, acknowledged that Jesus was a holy man, at least of sorts. He was an itinerant teacher, a pseudo-rabbi pseudo at that point. And they thought that he, might, that he should be not so dissimilar to themselves. And so he should attract people, the right kind of people, the holy people, the theologically astute people, the righteous people. But Jesus, as you know, he attracted the socially and the morally compromised, who had betrayed God and betrayed God's people, and were often uncomfortable to be around. They were, in this particular instance, the tax collectors and the sinners. The tax collectors, those were Jews who had betrayed the Jewish people because as an occupied um, people, they would go and collect taxes from Jews and take it to the occupier Romans. And they had a reputation for demanding a little bit more than Rome required and lined their own pockets with it, were the sinners. And this often meant those who were involved in sexual sins and that kind of stuff, adulterers, those who slept around before marriage, those who were involved in perverse versions of this, or they become or used prostitutes, often through the pagan temples of the Roman Empire. So they were, again, betrayers of God as well as sinners. Jesus, when he tells the Pharisees and the scribes these three parables, they were parables of judgment about a shepherd 
who leaves the 99 and seeks out the lost sheep, about a woman who turns all the lights on and cleans the house until she finds the one lost coin, despite having others. And in that passage, we did read about the father who desperately tries to connect with his two lost sons. He asks them a question by telling these parables. If you lost a sheep or a coin or a son, wouldn't you go seek them out in the very same way? Why should Jesus not then seek out the lost? Why should the body not seek out tax collectors and sinners? Our hope is that the Pharisees would see that Jesus was doing in this passage, in how he confronted them, that, he would, that they would see that he's inviting them to see God's law and God's word a bit differently than they currently do, more accurately to God's purposes for his instruction that is in his word. It's so clear from the next two interactions that are not recorded in this chapter, but in the 16th chapter of Luke, that they did not hear that invitation. Jesus eventually says to, him, to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God, God knows your hearts. He knows what's really going on. For what is exalted again, for what is exalted among men is abomination in the sight of the Lord. Judgment, echoes of Jeremiah's words, echoes of the psalm. These are Old Testament themes that Jesus is speaking in the New Testament. The more things change, apparently, the more they stay the same. Unfortunately, there is a way in which humans and we believers among such can become so confident in our ways of seeing things, the world, seeing others, even seeing the scriptures, that we lose track. We lose track of what God is trying to do. God is trying to do among us and in us and through us in the world. Some of you know about the Barna group. George Bar Barna is a believer and a man who cares greatly about the church, and he began this group to do high quality and statistical research around people's beliefs and behaviors and attitudes. A few years ago, the Barna group did some research on the ways in which the followers of Jesus are perceived by those who are outside of the church. They found that almost uh, that almost all non-Christians had a negative, somewhat negative or very negative perception of Christians. Only 9% had a positive opinion. Fewer than 10% associated with Christians words like caring or hopeful or friendly or encouraging, generous and good-humored with people who were evangelical, who said the gospel was important to them. Instead, Christians were seen, are seen as narrow-minded, homophobic, misogynistic, misogynistic, <laughs> puritanical, uh, uptight, and racist. 61% of people outside the church see Christians first as hypocritical. None of the top 10 things that people perceived in Christians included anything like we might find in the teachings of Jesus for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, loving or humble, merciful, generous. It seems as though we in this room and the church across our community and world had about as much, had about as much impact on our culture as the Pharisees. Not a good one. Not the God, not what God intended. Now, I'm not down on the church. Please hear that for sure. I'm part of it. So judgment, while this, not, this might not be all about you or all about me, it seems that it's true about us, the church. It might here be helpful to know about how God sees judgment. First, he mostly is paying attention to our heart, our attitude. And second, he especially is paying attention to when we should know better 
but do not. That's, those are the two things that God seems to focus on. God is concerned with our ignoring of what he has said and about how the grace, how the nature of his work, his work in the world, his work in and through us actually occurs. And he's worried about our hypocrisy, our treating of others with the demand that we ourselves, as children of grace, are not required to fulfill. When Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep and coins and brothers, the preponderance of weight is on the shepherd, the woman, and the father. What he's trying to say, the Pharisees and the scribes, and maybe we, his disciples throughout time, is that love of others would send us out to find them like the shepherd and the woman and the father, and not to condemn them, but to share grace and kindness and mercy with them, and to do so, do so from the posture of humility. For we, too, are sinners. We'll pray in just a little bit, Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive others who have sinned, those who have sinned against us. So Pharisees and scribes, and too often the church, we become judgmental of one another, those outside the church and those inside the church. And sometimes we simply cannot imagine that how we treat others or how we view others is wrong. We simply can't imagine that our, our concepts of the world, our political affiliation, even our view of the scriptures might be wrong. And that, in fact, it's Jesus and his way of doing things that are right. So judgment in the Bible is when God rightly judges when we're in those places. It's not spurious. It's not out of the blue. It's not trying to trip us up. It's when we know better. So Jesus is right. We've got to pay attention to that. And we can and are at times wrong. It's we that need to change, not God. The good news is that the parable not, is not just not a parable of judgment, but it's a parable that contains in it how to live out the life that God intends, how to digest the gospel. The word evangelical now means more as a political orientation researchers are finding, but as originally, Evangelical meant somebody who was concerned with, knew the shape of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, in telling his parables, is also showing us how we should live, what kind of attitude, the ways we can engage with one another. He's teaching us about the gospel. And so just three quick things for us this evening. First is that the gospel starts with the assumption that everybody, people that we know are inside the church and people that we think are outside the church, that everybody, God desires to be part of the church. They're a sheep that's not with the fold. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody is saved. Rather, that it points to the orientation of the shepherd. It points to the orientation that God has had for us. That we before the grace that has been extended to us in Jesus Christ, we were sheep that were outside of the fold. We were lost. And that's, that's the love that God has for us, for you and for me. So I think you're a believer because I know most of you. So that means that we all have been included because of this fundamental orientation that we, like all, God intends to become part of the fold of God. Nobody is outside the love of God, is another way to put it. Every the world, everyone in the world is supposed to be where we are. And God is a shepherd who goes out to the lost and the least because they're important to him, because they matter to him, because they're valuable to him. This is love. This is love. See, the Pharisees wouldn't include any of us, at least not me, in their holy clutch. Because when I, before I became a believer, I was just a sinner in need 
of mercy and grace. It's that attitude that's judged by God, not the reality of us being sinners. He seeks us out. Second, the gospel isn't fundamentally a come here message, but a go there message. Jesus attracted who he did in part because he wasn't where all the holy people was. He did go weekly to the synagogue and yearly or more to the temple. But the Great Commission begins with go, and that's what Jesus did. He, he went out into the world around him. The love of God who sent his son Jesus Christ to us is the example. When we were sinners, you and me, we were away from the place where God wanted us to be, and so he sent Jesus to come and find us by the Spirit and through other believers. So a gospel orientation is, as we look at others that maybe we don't quite understand why they do what they do, why they think what they think, why they vote the way they vote, why they whatever the way they do, the fundamental orientation is that still God and we are to be connecting with them, to love them, to value them, as somebody who's supposed to be part of the fold, and then to go to them. That's true most naturally, I think, for evangelicals outside of the body of Christ, but it's also true within the body of Christ. If we don't understand why a brother or a sister is behaving in the way they do, we, we're to take this same orientation and go and ask and listen. Go and be somebody who's like Jesus with them. So again, the Pharisees wouldn't have done that. They would have expected everybody to shape up before they came in. They didn't go, they stayed. For the gospel is fundamentally a going gospel. And third, once in, once people are part of the gospel, the gospel does not change its shape. It doesn't become something different. And that's so often what has happened to, within the body of Christ. That's why those statistics are what they are, because we who have been brought in by grace, sought out by God, loved by God, we become, unfortunately, too rigid. We become judgmental. We forget the shape of the gospel. We forget the good news that has brought us in. In the parables, when the sheep is found, or the coin is found, when the lost sons are found, the shepherd, the woman, and the father, they all throw parties. And I want you to hear that. They all throw parties, and so the picture of being in is a party. A party. That's the, the picture, the long-term heavenly picture, also, of what it means to be part of the church, part of the body of Christ. It's a party. And who goes to a party and says, hey, margarita for you, oh wait, not for you. It's not what happens. A party, you're happy that everybody is there. And if you need to have a conversation, you go with a party attitude. Tell me about what you're doing today. How are you doing? That kind of thing. That's because there's more joy in heaven for one righteous person who repents than for the 99 righteous people who are already there. It's a party. The picture is the heavenly banquet, a time of joy, because of the grace that we share together from God. It's a party. And so it simply doesn't make sense to do it any other way. So the gospel doesn't change its shape once we're inside the body. The very same things that drew us in the grace of God is the way in which we're supposed to respond to those inside the body and those outside. I unfortunately, in my young life as a believer, I became a believer when I was just about 20, just in my first year of college, and I had a lot of what people would call obvious sin that I had to deal with. And by the grace of God and the good encouragement of others, a lot of that was how God transformed me in that period of time in my life. And I think I've told you stories about some of that. And I, I look back and I think those are the glory years of my Christian faith because of how much I changed. And I really loved those years. But I began, after those glory years, to kind of see myself as having my Christian act together. And I don't think I was very nice to other believers. And I started to think about those outside of the body of Christ as being 
sinners. Not targets of God's love, who, like I had been and like I still live in sin, but targets of God's love. So I became self-righteous instead of righteous, and there's a big difference. So Jesus, when he teaches, and Paul, when he teaches in line with that, he says that we are to comfort others with the comfort that we have received from God. So that shape stays the same. Within the body, we are to be sharing the love and the mercy and grace that God has given us with others all the time. So Jesus was hanging out with sinners and tax collectors, not because they were part of his holiness club, because they had the same theological perspectives he did or thought exactly like him, but because he loved them. That's the fundamental truth. He didn't see them as evil, but as worthy, worthy of his attention and of God's grace. So you can hear this in what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. And he, he sees the privilege of the place he's in. He says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. He was a sinner, but see how God has recast it for him? He acted in ignorance and unbelief. Now he's become enlightened by the gospel of God and he now is gonna act in belief. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He's writing this to Timothy, a beloved brother in Christ. And then says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves not some acceptance, but full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the foremost. That's Paul. He says, because of this, for that very very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So our, our lives, the grace of God in us, is the example, not our righteousness. And so we can all say that very same thing, except for the grace of God, there go I. And so, brothers and sisters, our goal is to join together with Paul's doxology at that point, which is now, to the eternal King, immortal, visible, the only God, to him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and join together in proclaiming that faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, but of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and brought to Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accord with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge us living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask your prayers.
for God's people throughout the world. And for our Bishop Kim, for this gathering, and for the priesthood of all believers, pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and what we have asked faithfully, grant that we may obtain effectually the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have not done done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and have come up with repentance. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand? The peace of the Lord be always with you. Also, please share that peace with one another. The peace of the Lord be with you. Ascribe to the Lord the honor of his name, bring offerings and come into his courts.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of life and life. You made us in your image and call us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. That the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now our Savior Christ has taught us we're bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Take them and 
and remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Eternal God, uh, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of body and blood. Send us down into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage, love and serving, who gladness and singleness of our heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You can stand for the blessing. Brothers and sisters, go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. 
Hold fast to that which is good. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.
So why would I have used that? No, no. Is that what it was? Why would I have used that? I love to read it. Because it's a tape on. I like to read it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me not pick up on that. That was the key. I use it so easy. Really, it was the same music. The same music as the last color. Michael Hart's take Yes, it was. Different But very different ring. Yeah, very different ring. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Play it again. That's bigger than now. So he, he takes it. You know, I have decided. It's just yeah. very traditional. Yeah. I have but this, 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 this is a Western 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 No more rank time almost. Yeah. Almost more rank time. Yeah. Are you going to do that for more? Yes, yeah. both service. Thank you. Thank you. Both service. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good to see you, Dennis. Tony, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent. I'm doing excellent. I guess so. I'm here for a better Why don't you look at the first? I do know that. Because I don't know. No, I don't Why don't I have a cold? I don't know. 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 So how are you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Wednesday, the yeah. first yeah. 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 Did you ever come to lunch and like when you went to school here? Probably half a dozen times. So I did in the background. And he was talking to one of his professors for your flood in Michigan State. No, University of Michigan. University of Michigan. Jakura. And so he loves to talk about the University of Michigan. He loves to talk about the I, uh, I would never do it in the state of Michigan. No. <laughs> People talk, ask me out here. You're from Iowa. Tell me about the Iowa Iowa State Lottery, by the way. They played the game. And I tell them, it's emotional. It's a lottery, but it never gets irrational. Yeah. Ohio State Michigan gets irrational. Yep. Yeah. Alabama Auburn gets irrational. Yeah. Georgia, Florida gets irrational. Iowa, Iowa State, and so if something happened tonight, and nothing's ever gotten irrational. And the funny thing is, the fans, the, two, the fans of the two schools actually like them both. They just divide when they play each other, and then they go full court. Well, it's the state of Iowa, you know. It's, it's kind of true Midwestern. And there's no other big thing yeah. for them to follow. Yeah. It's either that or it's not. So, yeah, I don't know. Be careful about how high state Michigan. Oh, let's just say there's, I don't think there's two other states that yeah. you know, are a war against Harvard. Yeah. 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 The thing is, like, behind the scenes, you know, they cooperate with all Yeah, everything outside of football. Yeah, and you know, sometimes I think about the high, well, Michigan kind of too. There are other things that will be so you know, and, and I, Ohio State, the Ohio State University. Right, trademark. They trademarked it because of what they Well, there was a whole lot more good stuff going on there than just football. Yeah. The other side of it. And same as for Michigan. Yeah. 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 And say this for Michigan and the Jesus for everywhere else. They got, yeah, great. I would say, even as Ohio State team, Michigan is better academics. Ohio State is very good academics at Michigan. It's, 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 yeah, Michigan. Probably a top three, yeah. top yeah. university. Yeah. Michigan. That's way up there. And surprisingly, Ohio State is a shocking yeah. experience. Yes. Michigan is a small academics. Yeah. Ohio State is like its own city. It is. It is. And Columbus, by the way, is the largest city in Ohio. Yeah. It's not Cleveland. It's not Cincinnati. It's Columbus. You like it there? Yeah. I like Cincinnati. You're in Cincinnati. Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to college. For How long do you have to go up there? I don't go. No, I don't want to. How far is it? Hour and ten. 
So that's why I'll, I, if there's no way, I don't want to take over. What do you find you up and just experience the place? Look, I'm happy happy aquaculture, sir. Sure. You no, know, I mean, just, you know, once or twice to say, yeah, I've walked around the campus. I kind of know. I wanted to go to Fulgate at some point. Well, there's always that. They have a lot and a lot of tickets to, to deal with. I they have a lot of demand for tickets. I would imagine there are a lot of tickets for them. There are. Especially if you don't try to go to, who was it they just played the other night? No. Oh, Notre Dame. Okay, or the Michigan game. Yeah. Which will be in Columbus this year. You probably will be able to get tickets. No, you can get a ticket, but it's still concerns whatever, 110,000. I either played Arkansas today at the state today and it's still a sellout. Now I'm like, that's just that's impressive. Um, have you ever seen that? Do you know anything about marching bands? I will march in band in high school, but I actually did not watch the last day band. So the band does this traditional thing. Okay. And which they come out in a block. Now, yeah. They're not as big as they used to be. When I saw them do it live in Iowa City, they divided into two bands and did it on both sides. But when it, it's a block and they yeah. start marching, yeah. and, and they start spelling out a script, oh, hi, oh. Yeah. Yeah. And at the very end of the line is a tuba. And the tuba breaks off and box the eye. Uh, and the place just goes. Yeah, Even the, uh, they, they brought their marching band to a game in Iowa years and years ago. They, they did it on both sidelines, so both sidelines could read the Ohio and down to the Iowa Kutubas and even the Iowa. Uh, so go watch, it's really worth it. Uh, it's fun. Uh, Are you going to stay there? What's uh, uh, it? I don't. I, I'm there for at least uh, ten other three or four years. After that, I have no idea. Somewhere back out here. Yeah. Go for the west. Denver, Seattle, Portland. I like Alaska. He grew up in that stuff. So he really likes stuff. I like. I like this like today. The Pacific Northwest has an aura and an ambiance to it, unlike yeah, any other part of the country. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. misty, cool days like this are kind of their trademark. Yeah. Um, the green there is so green, but they are green. Even, I would say, the like Ohio green is pretty green. Yeah, it is. Midwest. Yeah. Lots of rain. Yeah. Lots of rain. There's, there's a reason I like to say they're called the Bengals, because it's a jungle in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it, you know. I don't know, did you have, growing up in Washington, did you have a lot of humidity? No, no humidity. Okay, so you're having... That's new. They you're having humidity really to that. Yeah, you get used to it. But you, you do. Yeah, it's different, for sure. So, so this all uh, rain and no humidity? How's that going? Well, well it's, it's humid, but it's, you know, when it rains, it's like 50 degrees. So when it's humid and 50, you don't really feel the like humidity. Then, oh, then, then, then so you got it all right. Yeah. 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 So, I my grandson's football game up in Wellington and it was 50 and raining. Yeah, that's cool. I was so, I, I only made it through half the game. By the time I got to my car, I was just shaking like that. I had to warm up before I could grab the wheel and drive oh, yeah. That's when a hot shower goes good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I... You don't want to see this look any older. I know. It's kind of irritating. Yeah. I find that kind of irritating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. I don't know if Fritz has told you a little bit about music at my church, but it's a, like, what we have here for the service is what we can get on an average summer Sunday. Uh, so it's a small space, church. Space no, it's bigger. It's a bigger church. It's a little bigger. Yeah. This is quaint. You can feel it's cozy with that number versus ours. You know, if we're in low 20s, could feel a little sprout. We have a more normal day in the fall where it's high 30s and it goes more cold. But we have this density of musicians that is just unbelievable. Wow, you're in a big yeah. So and we have we have two retired, we have a couple that's a retired organ set of organists in the area. We got a harpist, we have two oboists, we have another two guys that are talented. One is actually a singer songwriter like a piano. You can sing a sort of talent. So anyways, I always well, they're blessed about that, but coming here, what I'm always impressed with is the ability to play to the space. And kind of the, the dynamism, soft and loud and all that. I think you do such a good job of it. Well, thank you. Good reminder. You know, when I started here, the world afraid of the organ in this space. Yeah. And I kept it way under wraps. And it's just been a gradual process to open it up and open it up. 
and see what the tolerance of the congregation actually is. Yep. Okay. And the bottom line is, we have a bunch of organ aficionados here. We have some people who come here to hear the organ. Not, not don't misunderstand, not me play it. And they come here to hear the organ. Okay. There are a lot of places around where they had organs, but they didn't like them. And so we have a pretty rich people um, who really like that. And you know, before, just before we divided Sunday morning now, so we're back down, uh, like the two services that we can say. Before that happened, we were getting up with the money. Yes. And you can, in that case, you can really open the organ up when you have that people. And they will just sing yeah. out of it. Almost at the end. Yeah. Even tonight, I have decided to follow Jesus. Yeah. Who knows that song? You do? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's got such a, it's, a, it's one of those melodies, though, that yeah, you hear it once and it's hard. Yeah. Right. And so I, I, I because of the way he listed the bulletin oh, times three, yeah. Yeah. I want I want to be sure I would I had to fight with myself. Okay, that means only the first line times three, and then you yeah, see yeah, the last yeah, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, they got, it. They got it. <laughs> but the level of singing on that just beyond what I could possibly yeah. imagine. Well, I um I know as soon as you started seeing the first hymn, well, John, John, John was here. Yeah. I do. I, I didn't even see him. I got my up. John said he was keeping up with the temples tonight. Some reason. I don't know what got into it. <laughs> he normally like two people. And then I have to push the order a little more. Like, I'm listening in. It's <laughs> yeah, that's not really fast. We've got these big, the big bass speakers down there and underneath the pew on the other side over there. Yeah, and you yeah. see it under the pew there? Under the back pew. You have to really yeah. bend down. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I've always, I always saw those. Yeah. And then there's the back speakers that we only use. What do you use? Well, very convenient, but we all, I also used only those to chant the song to. I wanted to see how it was going to work. Oh, oh yeah. Work. But yeah, so we've got speakers back there, back there, up here, up here, and then the big ones underneath. And this, this organ has quite the. Sitting in the back, you back there. So yeah, yeah, you got the pew. I didn't really want my cell phone to be vibrating. The pew was vibrating. I'm going to have enough money. So, I'm going to try to do that all the time. Someone's falling asleep over there. There you go. Right off. It is my considered thing that there is absolutely nothing in the service that we do, any service ever, that is more important than the corporate Sunday. I mean that's I think that's an important thing to hold. This yeah. principle. That's not to say corporate singing is more important than anything else, but it is not less important anymore. It's right up there with everything. And that's what I really, really, really try to promote. And I feel like in the last year we've made real progress. So yeah. We'll come back and visit more often. I try once a year. Really? That's the best you can do. How often do you get home to see mom and dad pretty often? I go home once a year, and they come out three or four times a year. They come out a lot more than I go out. But yeah. well, there's two of them have to travel to home. You want to get home. It's true. One, my parents is also retired, and that one's gonna, my dad's going to retire in probably a year and a half. So. He's a forest guy. Yeah, forest engineer. State? Yeah, forest roads in the state of Washington. So he's a civil engineer? Force engineer, one of the two force engineering programs in the country. Oregon State. Oregon State? Yep. Four valves. Yep. I remember meeting them. Yeah. They say to them, I shouldn't have said anything, I don't think. You look great to be young to have a kid that age. There you go. And your mom said, no, I can, I can assure you, peace out. Well, you look pretty young.